Hello, um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, hunting darts from the Yukon. So you're all you're all there right now. Um, but what I'm talking about is not Europe at all. I'm talking about sites uh, in the mountains way over there in the northwestern part of North America. Um, and this is an area that has been uh, for for most of 14,000 years um, inhabited by indigenous hunter gatherers, and they were. Um, a hunting and gathering culture continuously right up until about a hundred years ago. And, uh, and why I, I tried to fit this talk into this session is, um, is people are always talking about stone tools and, and as, you know, archaeologists are struggles to try to visualize things that are very old and, and very often subject to a lot of decomposition. Um, so the struggle is real. So this is kind of a talk about projectile points, but I won't be talking about the stone tool aspect of it all that much. So again, visualizing stone tools, the projectile points, especially the very ancient ones. I mean, we imagine them as the, the pieces at the end of the steer kind of thing. And whether they're sophisticated or not very sophisticated recreations of them, they're, you know, some of these recreations are based on our research. Some of them are accurate. Some of them are not. But um, one phenomenon in archaeology that has been kind of helping us understand how ancient um, technologies actually looked is ice patch archaeology. And it's a kind of a global phenomenon that you find all over the world. And uh, the, the objects I'm going to be talking about today come from ice patches in the, the southern Yukon. And these are very specific task-related sites that we understand as task-related sites. They're hunting sites where people were hunting mostly caribou, pinhorn sheep, um, in the alpine areas and occasionally bison. So everything I'm going to be talking about there, its function was a hunting tool from this type of hunting site. And they're preserved because they got lost in these, uh, these snow drifting sites. So what can we see? I'm going to, I'm going to sometimes, you know, we find a lot of very well preserved things in uh, ice patch archaeology. We got very lucky last year. I hope this video plays just so you can see what it is that we found melting out of the ice. You want to see that again? Just <laughs> just because. Um, there it is. That's a, that's a two meter long, uh, perfectly preserved hunting dart. Every bit of the thing was uh, completely intact. Um, and it melted out, over, out of ice over about a three week period. And we were quite fortunate to collect it. And it it remained in that in that uh, condition um, for 6,000 years. So it's a 6,000 year old hunting dart. Um, and it is a find that is kind of 20 years in the making. Ice patch archaeology in the Yukon started about in about uh, 1997 when a hunter turned in this small piece of wood in Yukon territory, wood, bone, all these uh, um, organic materials. They really don't survive that well. It's a very acidic environment. But when we found this, it was radiocarbon dated to be about 4,000 years old, and we realized that we were looking at the part of a hunting tool um, that was probably related to this, uh, this atlatl type of weapon, throwing dart, something that we'd only imagined. We returned to that site, and we, we excavated, uh, or we let melt the rest of the object out, and it was an um, almost complete 4,000-year-old dart. So a little bit about what an atlatl is. It's a, um, a lot of people um, know it. It's a, it's a, we call it a throwing dart. Um, it's a spear, kind of like what this fellow is holding there, a spear propelled by a lever. Um, you can see it in these kind of more uh, um, traditional Aztec drawings. Um, and it is a technology that's uh, regionally extinct in the, in the Yukon from our ice patches. We found uh, hundreds of little fragments of atlatls and and our oldest one is going back now about 9,500 years before present, um, made out of wood. And but the technology in this uh, part of the southern Yukon, it disappears abruptly about 1,100 years ago. And people transition, start using the bow and arrow, um, which is a technology that people in Europe and Siberia and Asia have been using for a very, very long time. So our uh, throwing dart collection, it's... It's fairly variable, and I guess that's the point that I'm going to try to drive home to you today is that there's a lot of variability, and a lot of what I'm talking about is mostly from collections that aren't as intact as that one spear I just showed you, from fragments, more or less complete um, pieces, um, very small fragments of pieces, but um, there's kind of two things that unify what a, a throwing dart or an atlatl is. 
Um, every specimen we have has a dimple at the very proximal end where the hook for that throwing board that I uh, showed you in that Aztec representation goes. There's a dimple on every one of them at the end where the, where the um, thrower was put in there. And almost every single one of them is tipped with a stone point. But between those two parts of the object, there's actually a, a very surprising array of variability, things that we wouldn't have imagined um, would be present um, you know, in 1996. So uh, I'll start off with this very uh, great infographic that someone else made. But um, these are, you know, after studying these for 20 years, we've, we've come up with uh, more or less three types of darts. So um, at the top, you can see a one-piece dart. Most of these are made from uh, saplings. The types of wood that we find in this collection are extremely limited. We find willow, which is salix, um, birch, betula, and spruce wood, which is pecia. All the one-piece darts are made out of saplings. We also have darts with four shafts and what we call segmented darts. And a lot of these uh, other two categories are made up using different carpentry techniques and different materials. So there's a picture of a one-piece dart that's uh, melted out in various fragments. Um, it's, uh, this one is willow. It is, um, you see there's sinew lashing, tying things together. The point is held in with sinew. Um, there's a little bit of fletching at the end. All of our throwing darts appear to be fletched. But this is a one piece, uh, one piece of wood. So someone found a, a tree, approximately the right size, cut it down and made a dart out of it. Um, more commonly in our collection, we find uh, darts with, uh, with four shafts and segments. So how I just define uh, four shafts is a little bit different than what you, you might expect. The first way I define four shafts is when there's a piece of the dart that's made in a completely different material. And in our collections, the different materials that we do find to make four shafts are either antler, probably from caribou, or bone. So, so here's an example of some of the four shafts that we find on specimens like uh, this one. There'd be a stone point there, and that big bark one would have a stone point in the end of it. Um, some of our, uh, our osseous four shafts are very uh, uh, complicated and beautifully designed. We also have ones that are much more crudely designed, like this one. It's just kind of roughly hacked out of a piece of antler, and there would have been a stone point tied right in there, and this end would have been tied to the, the wooden throwing dart. Um, here's an 11 and a half thousand year old example. It was actually found in Alaska, but you can see how these types of four shafts work. So this is elk antler, and these stone points are just tied right on the end of them, not even in a, a little U-shaped notch. Um, some of the, we've got two projectile points that are osseous in our collection that aren't designed and some of you will enjoy this one, not for the, the bifacially chipped stone points, but for microblades. So we've got two of these things. This is a 8,100 year old uh, four shaft. It's got slots on either side, a little piece of art. And I have made this, uh, this crude uh, graphic to show how the microblades we think have gone into these things. All these. When we look inside those slots, there's little chips of rock and also a lot of spruce sap. So people were gluing those little pieces into the, uh, into the fore shaft. Um, another way to find fore shaft is when um, the, the, the fore shaft of the spear is made from wood, but the wooden part is designed to detach. So in a lot of our collections, we'll find um, this little conical hang at the uh, proximal end of the fore shaft. There's a projectile point. If it's designed to come apart, I call that a foreshaft. And it is, uh, I'm not sure if it's an interesting distinction or not, but we do find that most of our darts are actually segmented darts. So this is what I call a foreshaft. But we also find a lot of uh, elements of these hunting spears that we now call segments. And it's because they've got what is, they're attached using this carpentry technique called the scarf. And I'll show you a bit what that looks like. So. Segmented darts could be made of two pieces of wood, three pieces of wood, four pieces of wood, however many pieces of wood, they're all tied together at these segments. Sinew and two scarf joints hold the spear together. So that's a actually surprisingly common uh, variant of the uh, throwing dart. And that scarf joint must be pretty, uh, um, from an engineering perspective, pretty uh, strong. Because we even got one dart that's got what? Um, my predecessor, Greg Hare, called an axe shaft, so that scarf joint is 
right at the very back of the dart. So imagine the kind of uh, force going through that uh, throwing sphere when someone whipped it, and that little, and that piece of wood is about this, the thickness of a pencil. Um, a lot of our collections, um, all of our all of our throwing dart collections appear to be flesh. So we we identify fleshing either from sinew and little fragments of feather being stuck in the sinew, but more commonly when we're looking at the wood, you can see the staining of the, the sinew and the paint on the, on the proximal end of the dart where the fleshing was intact. It's very uh, difficult to identify the types of feathers that we see because they're so rare we don't want to hack them up and uh, do the DNA on them. Um, we see two types of uh, fleshing on our darts. A uh, more simple one is um, where someone will take a long feather and they'll They'll just tie the feather on at each end of the, of the feather, and it creates a very simple fletch. We're not sure if this is designed to make that uh, throwing dart spiral in the air. A second type of fletching style that we find, and it's a, and it's a sample, it's one that we see in the 6,000-year-old dart, but people are seemingly also making more complex fletches that make the throwing dart spiral in the air, much like an arrow might. So, what they're doing is they're, they're clipping and cropping the feathers. These are eagle feathers. Um, they're tying the feather on at multiple points on the dart as well as wrapping it on the end. And you can see that they're piercing the, uh, the quill of the feather to get those in there. So a very, very interesting and complex process for making the fletchings on these darts. So, and I think I'm going to conclude pretty quickly, but this is the state that we found this hunting dart in. And just to get an idea of, you know, the type of variability or the, the complexity of the material use in some of these collections, and it would have been present in, in, in all sorts of ancient, ancient hunter-gatherer collections, even here in Europe. Um, I'll tell you what we know about this spear to date. So this is a spear. The, it is made of three segments of birch wood. The birch is derived from a tree that was split into four pieces and then carved down into staves. Each individual piece tied together with sinew wrapping. We don't know where the sinew is coming from, but probably caribou or moose. It has got a projectile point tied in. Um, all the sinews on this piece um, are treated with a preservative, and that preservative that we've been able to identify is castorium, which is a secretion that is coming out of a, a large kind of a lake rodent, the beaver. Um, and it's a, it's a very waxy secretion. The beaver will rub it all over itself to waterproof its fur. People were using that same product to water treat, we believe, the sinews on their, uh, their hunting dart. There is traces of ochre on this material, so ground ochre for paint. In the half of the projectile point, people put raw spruce sap in there as a form of glue. These fletches are made from eagle feather, and you can see they're designed by taking each feather, cutting it across, cutting the quills across the end, and then they're making these triangular little clips in there. Each feather is, is laid on the, the same face of the diameter of the spear, and we believe that this type of fleshing is designed to give this spear a counterclockwise spin in the air. So it's a, it's a beautiful piece. Very lucky to have found it. Anyway, that's my talk. Thank you. These are my collaborators. <laughs>